there. There it goes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it is uh, music in our schools month. So we were fortunate last meeting to have Chinook Wolf Pack eighth grade orchestra play for us prior to the board meeting. And as uh, Mr. Galbraith said tonight, we had Kamaik and Scarlet and Gold. So uh, we really appreciate our music teachers and our music programs and uh, thank you to our students who came out to play before the board meetings this month. Um, it's also uh, School Retirees Association Appreciation uh, Week. And so uh, we are here tonight to recognize our partners from Benton Franklin School Retirees Association. Uh, they do wonderful work in our community to support our schools. They provide scholarships for our students, mini grants for our teachers, and advocacy in our community for um, all things schools. Uh, we get to go and present at uh, uh, luncheon every year. Uh, we being the uh, my superintendent colleagues from Pasco and Richland and I, and um, they're always just very gracious hosts and we appreciate all that you do for us and for the community. So we have four members uh, here this evening, Victoria Russell, Dottie Stevens, Diana Baker, and Helen Brugman. So if you could come on up, please. I want you to be standing up here uh, while I read the governor's proclamation and we present you with some uh, little gifts of appreciation and then give you a chance to say anything that you that you might want to say tonight. So. Uh, the governor's proclamation reads as follows. Whereas Washington State recognizes the accomplishments of all retired school employees, and whereas it is important to acknowledge the value of educating and assisting retirees in meeting the special challenges retirement brings and work to improve their general welfare, and whereas school retirees and organizations like the Washington State School Retirees Association aid in advancing education by supporting high educational standards, and whereas school retiree organizations such as the WASRA provide, excuse me, promote group and individual involvement in charitable projects and activities, sponsor scholarships and maintain interest and participation in education and community activities. And whereas retired educators are encouraged to remain active in the education profession through volunteer activities associated with learning now, therefore, I, Jay Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby proclaim March 18th to 24th, 2024, as School Retirees Appreciation Week in Washington, and I urge all people in our state to join me in this special observance. So we certainly appreciate uh, our local chapter here and these um, ladies specifically for all that you do for our schools. So. of appreciation for each of you and it comes with a little bunt cake and a little um, Kennewick pen that says oh. you're pretty stupendous <laughs> <laughs> we love it. so as I'm handing these out if, it, if there was anything I wasn't sure if you wanted to share Thank you so much. I am the current president of the BFSRA. Uh, Victoria and I seem to share on and off co-president last year. Now I'm president this year and next year. I find out we now have a two year term. Anyway, <laughs> we as BFSR retirees are still active in our communities and we vote for public schools. How many voted? There you go. We're all voting for you and we support scholarships for future teachers and student teachers. We support many grants for out-of-pocket expenses to support students, mostly literacy projects. There are 800 plus of us locally, and we show up for meetings, 81 on Monday, and 17,000 statewide. Today, uh, we are here with you. I'm Dottie Stevens, 41-year educator, 34 years in Kenwick School District. Yes. Victoria Russell, 44-year educator, teacher, 24 years Hanford High, winner of our State Hoban Award for 2023, which is service to us in our Benton Franklin School District. <laughs> Diana Baker, retired Lieutenant Colonel, Information Systems Specialist, teachers, People that are in the in the army or in any of those service areas can become teachers. 
and she became a teacher in Kenwick School District, Pasco School District, a teacher and a librarian, and she's our current nominee for the Hoban. And finally, we have Helen Bruggeman, Kenwick School District teacher, elementary middle school. I knew her best computers at Highlands Middle School, and she's a past Hoban nominee. And how many years did you work, Helen? I had 37 years, 20 in elementary, I'm 60. Look at that. And most, and how many were in, in the Kenwick School District? All of them. Thank you so much. All right, good evening. Um, we're gonna come uh, to you tonight to um, provide recognition for our winter sports and activities. We had a number of outstanding performances throughout the season, um, and we'd like to start with um, this time around. We kind of always do it alphabetically, but I'm gonna switch up a little bit. We'll start with Kennewick High School. And so um, Anna Harris will come up. Um, she's the athletic director at Kennewick High School, and we'll introduce um, her, her coaches and activities and then we'll have the um, participants who are present because it is kind of in the now and spring season. There might be some that are not quite here, but um, come up and then ha have an opportunity to shake hands with the board. So, thanks. I'm Anna Harris, Athletic Director at Kennewick High, and we have two groups with us today. First, we have our bowling program, and they won the state 3A championship this year which was a big accomplishment for our ladies. And we also had multiple placers. Lexis McGarity, who will come up and play second in state. Courtney Poss play, plays fourth. Sam McMaster, sixth. And Calista Tippett, seventh. Um, so they kind of stole everything at the 3A. <laughs> um, they did a great job. First at state, they first in league, first in 3A districts. Bowl over the year, Courtney Foss, coach of the year, Tom Richardson, who couldn't be here tonight, but it was a great accomplishment for them, and we'll get to hang their banners. Awesome. Quite a few of them are doing spring sports and all the club activities. I'd like to introduce our robotics advisor, Orby Gilliam, and he will talk about our newly robot. Uh, this is our first year uh, at Kennewick High with our robotic club. Uh, decided to be part of the uh, first uh, program and chose to take on the uh, first robotics uh, portion of it. And um, I was approached in August uh, with FIRST and was told that Kennewick or the Tri-Cities hadn't had a team in over a decade. Uh, so I said, you know what, I'll I'll step in and see what we can do at Kennewick High. So uh, as our first year uh, competing against teams uh, that's been in the league for 10 to 15 years, our very first uh, competition, we walked away with the uh, Rookie All-Star Award. Our second competition, we walked away with the Rookie uh, Inspiration Award, and we have uh, qualified for uh, Pacific Northwest District uh, Championship uh, Tournament, which is coming up in uh, Portland. Um, if we're successful there, we would get the invite to uh, Worlds, which would be in Houston uh, this year. And now uh, some of the team is uh, here. If you guys want to come up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 
So next we'll hear from Athletic Director Rick Wells from Southridge High School. Hello everyone, I'm Rick Wells. I'm the Athletic Director at Southridge High School. I have two different uh, groups to talk about today, uh, one team and one individual. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is our cheer team, our competitive cheer team. They're not able to be here tonight because they are literally getting ready for next year already. So a uh, pretty competitive group, did a great job this year. Uh, they've been on kind of a two-year journey in getting into competitive cheer. And this year, I'm very proud to announce that they got two state placements. They uh, qualified as number two in the state for game day uh, presentation. Um, and then they got number two in the state for their tumbling routine. So uh, really, really difficult uh, to be able to place in the top three in both and they my coach told me they're bound and determined to take the top prize here in the near future and knowing her that's probably going to happen uh she's pretty determined excellent coach and we had a i was also very proud to see that we don't just have females on the team we also have males on the team and um it's a really great uh group of young people so they got both second place in tumbling and second place in medium-sized game day for the 3a this year so very proud of them there And the next person I'm going to introduce is our uh, wrestling head wrestling coach, Andy Lagozo, and he has got our um, uh, a young man by the name of Jacob Chapa with him that I'll let him introduce. But I just want to recognize the fact that um, Jacob is come on up, Andy. Um, Jacob, in my opinion, is probably uh, all time, very possibly the best uh, wrestler in Southridge history. So I'll let Andy talk to him about him. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So Jacob competed in his uh, third state championships this year, which is all that was possible due to COVID. And he took second this year to uh, accompany his two state titles. So he won two titles and got a second um, very high on the list in the Southridge athletics uh, history. So he's done a lot of stuff outside of uh, the Southridge program. Also, he went to compete on the Washington State uh, wrestling team that competes in Fargo, North Dakota, Dakota and he also uh, competed at Reno Nationals and took third place. And last but certainly not least, Athletic Director from Kamaikan High School, Kyle Cowan. Thank you for having us today. Um, I'm joined today with three of our programs from this, the winter season. So uh, the first is going to be our bowling team. And so I'll introduce Scott Bigman. First, I want to thank you guys for uh, having all, all the athletes here. I know uh, they put a lot of hard work and time and dedication into all their crafts. And for you guys to recognize that, is, it is awesome to see. So thank you guys. Uh, our bowling team here, uh, we had a phenomenal year. Uh, we're fortunate to be in a very tough conference. Obviously, with, with Kennewick there winning state like they did, that's who we get to compete against you know, at least twice throughout the year. And uh, they make us better as a group. Um, we. Our program's on the rise. It's awesome. You know, the, we started six years ago, and we started with uh, one win in two seasons. And up to last year, taking third in in the state, and then this year, um, getting back to state and you know having a battle, and in the end, end up um, on top and winning the state title in the 4A division, which was a really cool thing for our program. Awesome. Yeah. I would like to, as an ego, I'd like to take credit for that, but. <laughs> Uh, these girls work hard. I know the Kennewick girls work extremely hard. A lot of these girls are bowling on Saturdays the whole year, if not on Sundays and, and Monday, Tuesdays in leagues. Uh, so they, they put a lot of time in their craft and it, it's very cool to see how hard these girls work. And, and it's not a fluke that both Kennewick and, and Kamaikan won a state title with all the hard work they did. And uh, very proud of them. Uh, 
Look, looking forward to I get all these girls back again next year. I know Kenwood team's going to be strong next year, so hopefully uh, we'll be back here doing the same thing with you guys in the future. So uh, congratulations. Thanks. Obviously, winning a state yeah, championship in 3A and 4A for bowling is a pretty big deal. Yeah. For That's awesome. Um, next, I'm going to bring up our uh, boys wrestling coach, uh, Jordan Anderson. All right, thanks for having us. Um, I'm here to honor Juan Hoffman. Uh, he got second place at the state tournament this year at 126 pounds. Um, he finished the season with a record of 35 and 6, and then he finished his high school career with a record of 93 wins and 15 losses, with 53 of those being pins. Um, he had a very successful career. Um, he got third as a sophomore, was unable to go to the state. Last year, he had a, a freak injury leading up to the state tournament, um, but got second this year. Um, he's Phenomenal kid. He's the type of kid that we have to kick out of the wrestling room because he wants to stay in there so long. Um, on his free time, he volunteers to help lead the next generation of Kamaika wrestlers with uh, our 5 to 13 year olds. Um, he's in there four days a week helping them out. Um, so he's an overall great kid and that he, he deserves all the success that he, he had this year. Um, and next year, he's planning on going to Eastern Oregon to wrestle there. We have our cheer program here as well. So our head cheer coach is, I think, in Jamaica right now. So our, one of our assistants is here is uh, Brent. So Brent, come on up. And... Thank you guys so much for having us here tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, so I want to talk about our cheer girls. Um, so this was the first year that we have gone to state in the last four years. Um, and not only did they do really well and qualify um, three different times before state in both of their um, categories, they actually um, got second place in the uh, 3A, 4A non-tumbling large category. So we are so proud of them. I um, want to introduce um, uh, Ella Greenalch and Lauren Perneda. They are our soft, sophomore captains from this year. Um, and then some of the rest of our um, awesome squad. So uh, really, really proud of them. Uh, me and the uh, head coach have been coaching together for two years and um, we've had big goals and they have risen to the occasion. Um, and they are definitely tough as nails. So we always say that. So I'd um, like to introduce them to you guys. So that concludes special recognition. So we'll we'll pause for a minute here and let folks scurry out that need to head out. forward with our next item on the agenda communication from parents staff and district residents 
The Kennewick School District Board of Directors appreciates hearing from the community at regular board business meetings. The Board of Directors set aside 30 minutes for communications from parents, staff, district residents. This time is reserved during the working meeting for the board to listen to comments, input, and information. The board does not respond to comments provided as the goal is to listen and to learn. Please know the board's silence is neutral. It's neither a signal of agreement nor disagreement with the speaker's remarks. As appropriate, the board will ask the superintendent and her staff to look into any issues raised. Finally, please remember that your words have impact and you, not the school district, are responsible for your words. We caution all speakers that it's possible that your statements could violate the rights of others under various laws, including laws protecting privacy and laws prohibiting defamation. If you are unsure of the legal effects of your remarks, you should seek independent legal advice. In any case, we ask that you help us role model for our students what a respectful and inclusive community looks and sounds like. Guidelines for addressing the board. Uh, you've signed in on the form already. We'll call your name. Uh, please come to the podium at the front of the room. You will have two minutes to address the board. A stoplight on the screen will let you know when to begin, when you have a minute remaining, and when your time has ended. Thank you for taking the time to be here this evening. And first, we have one online, I was told. Yes, Rachel Okay, so we'll, we'll get Rachel's. Hello, Rachel, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, you're good to introduce yourself then give her a public comment. Okay. You're, you're good, Rachel. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, my name is Rachel and um, at the last board meeting, I spoke passionately and watched the budget presentation. Uh, I wanna thank the board for your transparency and acknowledgement of the importance of mental health services in schools. Um, just a few things, according to the National Alliance on Mental Health in Washington, high schoolers with depression are two times more likely to drop out. There's 82,000 reported adolescents aged 12 through 17 who've been officially diagnosed with depression and over half of them went untreated last year. Um, the last board meeting, some other community members uh, talked about how we needed to proceed with vigor and find alternative solutions to this issue, which I'm now trying to call a crisis. Um, one person mentioned Hazel Health, and when I looked into the Hazel Health, I can see some flaws in their services, such as dealing with insurance and limited visits. Something, though, is better than nothing. Um, I was also exploring the OSPI website, and I saw that two years ago there was a grant called AWARE that could have helped Kennewick School District to implement permanent health, uh, mental health workers into our schools. was wondering if that had been looked into. Um, another resource available for students through Washington Healthcare Authority who have uh, Title 19 Medicaid services that are included in their IEP or IFSP that would help provide mental health services for those students. If that's not already being used, um, it should definitely be looked into. And then last but not least, some questions for consideration that I have forwarded to the board are have you asked the ESC 123 for help in looking for person in-person school-based therapy and how do you plan to address these students who are in unique circumstances with such as those who live with friends or in shelters or whose parents are not supportive of their child's mental health needs and the need for transportation is also uh, something that needs to be addressed thank you thank you rachel All right, we'll, we'll get moving forward here in just one second. There we go. I think it just needs to hang out. It's good now? Thanks, Joe. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Joe. All right, so next up we have Dottie Stevens. Good evening. I'm Dottie Stevens, Kenwick resident and KSD partner. Academic Link uh, recently came to my attention. I met Jan Link. She's associated with a nonprofit that supports students and families that I'm here to talk about to perform at satisfactory or better in academic areas of math and language. 
She is a retired educator and principal and has developed a curriculum of support and tutoring that is cost and time effective. We've talked about reading, writing, and arithmetic. She's the real deal. It is worthy of our consideration as a sixth grade tutoring program that considers all sixth graders in a middle school for recognition and improvement. Finances and training are provided in part from the Academic Link nonprofit, Three Rivers Community Foundation, and other outside sources. I previously did work for you as a uh, community uh, person that worked with curriculum, and um, she will be speaking to you shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dottie. Next up is Rama Devagupta. Sorry, try my best. Here. Good evening, Dr. Pierce, board members, community members, admin. I'm Rama Devagupta. I'm a National Board Certified Teacher from Southridge High School. I teach biology and forensics. I also teach honors biology and AP biology, depending on registration numbers. I'm also the science club advisor. So the reason I'm here today is to talk about STEM excellence. In the last board meeting, I understand there was some mention about STEM excellence, and I just came to make sure our board members knew that our science club students, two Southridge sons, Jacob Gray and uh, Eric Zurok, they placed on they earned honorable mention in the Mid Columbia Science Fair. For most of the people in the world, honorable mention doesn't sound like much. We only talk about people who go for a grand prize winner and go to the International Science and Engineering Fair. I am here to make my board members and my community members aware of how hard these two students have worked. The only reason they have excelled in STEM is because they got introduced to the Mid-Columbia Science Fair when they were in my honors biology class. They worked during lunch, after school, and sometimes sent emails at midnight. They have competed with students from Richland High School, Hanford High School, and other areas where there's a lot of parental support, where they have mentors from universities and PNNL. Our Southridge sons did it all on their own during lunch and after school. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Pierce for co-teaching with me last year. I want to introduce uh, in in what's the word I'm looking invite invite you all board members to come and co-teach with us, so you can become aware of what it is like to have your boots on the ground in today's world. And I also want to take a moment to thank Representative April Connors for coming to my classroom and teaching co-teaching with me about plastics in the ocean and finally i would like to say please support your teachers so that they can continue to work after school hours volunteering just for the sake of our students thank you for listening have a good evening thank you thank you all right next up is jan links link Thank you, Tracy Pierce and school board and members for letting me come and introduce myself. My name is Jan Link. During my professional career, I was an elementary teacher, curriculum director, elementary principal, and high school principal. I started at Mark Twain in Pasco, uh, went, taught in North Shore, was administrator in Corvallis, Oregon, and ended in the Edmonds School District. I have a tutoring center and a nonprofit called Academic Link Outreach, both focusing on academic support. For 20 years, my best friend, Wayne Smith, a generous man of Kennewick pride, watched my interest and passion for being a voice for children and helping them and their parents with academic well-being. Retiring, I followed and worked with 50 low-income students from middle school and through high school with 100% of them graduating in high school and all but four going on to postgraduate work. They taught me what needs to be present in school success, capturing what works I developed and am publishing in academic success learning labs, how-to manual, 
uh, with parents and incoming middle school students who earn D and F grades or do not pass the state test. The goal is to have students high school ready before they enter ninth grade. To finish my two minutes, Wayne passed away and left me money uh, through the Three Rivers Foundation to impact stu uh, Kennewick students, and I get to decide how to do that. He believed that increased academic achievement through supporting the parents, continuously using data to make all of your decisions, rewarding students who get ABCs and meet the state teacher and the state expectations, and providing more time and support to the struggling students when needed is the answer to many of our problems. He was correct. I just want to give you a face uh, for I will be sending information so that you can see the opportunities that you can have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Oh, Next. I forgot. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> Next up is Kaylee Osborne. Hi, my name is Kaylee. I attend Legacy High School, and you have no idea how much our support staff means to us. I came to Legacy around November 2022. In all honesty, I have been to two other high schools before Legacy. Nothing could ever really stick. After a few days, I had a panic attack, and I ran to the office crying. I was new, and I didn't know who to talk to. The receptionist then began to give me a list of people. I decided to go with Ramos. I sat there, and we did breathing exercises and just talked. As a person with a very high anxiety, it's nice to know no matter what, there's at least always somebody at the school who I can talk to. I don't know what I would do without Mr. Deal, Mr. Ramos, and Mr. Otis. Those people mean the world to so many kids at Legacy. So many kids at Legacy, the ones here today, and myself, and many more. They have made such an impact on so many students, giving a safe place to talk about anything. I know it was just a temporary contract, but you guys have to find a way to keep them around. I know. I know cuts will be made, and no matter what, nobody, not everybody will be happy, but don't take away the people who are giving kids a reason to keep going. I know Legacy needs them. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Next up, we have Mary Jane Kelly. Hello, my name is Mary Jane Kelly. I am a junior at Legacy High School and I am trying to represent that my school needs our support staff. I struggled a lot through my freshman year trying to get through because I caved in a lot of peer pressure and I struggled a lot with drug abuse and I don't think I would have. Take time. Next up is Diane Sunvik. So you will give me a moment, please, <laughs> because that was fairly touching. Thank you. So I'm also going to quote from the Association for Children's Mental Health that Rachel LaBelle talked about earlier. And according to them, one in five children and youth in the United States have a diagnosable emotional, behavioral, or mental health disorder. One in 10 have a mental health challenge that is severe enough to impair how they can function at home, school, or in our community. In addition, the percentage of mental health needs that are met for children and youth in Washington state is only 16% versus 27% throughout the rest of the state, or the rest of the country, excuse me. 27% isn't great, but 16 is abysmal. Nationally, only 40% of students 
with emotional, behavioral, or mental health disorders graduate from high school. So listen again, only 40% compared to 76% of national average. Over 50% of students with emotional and behavioral, but not including mental health disabilities, 14 plus drop out of high school. This is the highest dropout rate of any disability that we have. So Dr. Miller, I'm gonna to speak to you. You've been a very, um, in, it, this has been very important to you to talk about how we can raise on-time graduation rates. And you've talked about, you know, what's new, what's inventive, what can we do? We don't have to invent anything new. For um, if we can provide mental health services to our students who require it, that's the best way to increase graduation rates for up to 50% for these students. So I please ask you very strongly to consider retaining funding for mental health therapists. Thank you, Diane. That concludes communication from parents, staff, and district residents. We will now move on to number five, consent items. I will now entertain a motion for approval. I move to, to approve the consent items. Do we have a second? All second. Thanks, Mike. Second. Patty, if you'll call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Connors? Yes. Dr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Gledhill? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. And Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Thank you. All right. Next up will be communication follow up. Dr. Pierce, do you have anything to follow up? Uh, just a, a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, a number of people speaking last time uh, brought up the issue of mental health supports for students, and we've received um, an email recently and someone alluded to it tonight about some grant programs and so you know we're going to look actively at um, all of those grant opportunities to see what potentially is available so I just want to assure the board and assure um, you know people who are sharing we appreciate you know um, people passing along information about those opportunities and not assuming that we might already know about them so I just encourage um, anyone who comes across something else, <laughs> um, please, you know, email it to me and we will look into it. And, um, you know, our, our hope is that maybe, you know, maybe one of those grants or something will pan out. Uh, it's come too early at this point to tell, but we're certainly going to look into what's possible. Great. Thank you. All right. So we will now move on to superintendent board member reports. We will start with Mallory. A uh, few things. First of all, it's so nice seeing so many students here. Like in the beginning, like there's rarely ever any students. So it's really nice <laughs> to see this, our students here, um, especially our Kennewick teams go Kennewick. And um, also, um, I just have a lot of respect for those students being able to come up here and talk. We don't get too many students. So I really like seeing that and yeah, I just have a lot of respect for those students. Um, okay, so we had our last student advisory meeting, which was a focus group. Um, thank you, Ms. Glenhill for coming. Um, it went really well. We had about double the amount, or a little more than about double the amount of students that we normally do. Um, we gave them some background on financial literacy and um, caught them up to speed. And then we gave them a few different options of ideas that we're looking at of how to implement it and then had them kind of discuss in their groups go over pros and cons and and then at the end we asked them which um, variation they would like and I wouldn't say we got too much as of like one specific variation that we want to go to because it was sort of a tie but um, it was still helpful in the aspect of like which parts of the variations would work for them they think and which ones wouldn't and so we just got some good feedback overall and it just was really nice to see more students in here again i just love seeing the actual students um and then me and annie are working or we just started this week we're gonna start working on a promotional video for the incoming student board elect which will be shadowing annie next year so um, we're going to make a video, so stay tuned for that and share it if you see that coming your way. Um, 
that's all I have. That should be in the next couple of weeks. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Dr. Pierce. Okay, uh, just a couple things from me tonight over the past couple of weeks. Um, uh, one of the highlights I, I had that I wanted to share was a really excellent learning walk at Southridge High School. And um, that was conducted with uh, one of the assistant principals there who set it up um, for my team, who was a team of other assistant principals from the other high schools. And, um, you know, learning walks, I'm not sure how much uh, the board's familiar with that structure that we have in place, but we have all of our district office administrators who have um, any responsibility over um, instruction, uh, participate on teams with uh, building administrators from all levels, and uh, several times a year, um, the teams convene and conduct a classroom observation at uh, one of the schools. And our goal is to um, observe a lesson together and then debrief that lesson together in terms of what did we see and uh, what evidence did we collect through that observation that all that aligns with the Danielson instructional framework, which is the basis of our teacher professional growth and evaluation system. So the intent is ensuring that um, we as leaders are all interpreting what uh, proficient and distinguished instruction looks like in classrooms. And um, it's a very helpful structure that's been in place for several years, and we always change it up a little bit in terms of who's on what team and whether we're having people go into um, different levels or staying at the same level um, in terms of high schools viewing high school classrooms or um, we've done it different ways in different years. But I thought I just wanted to give a little precursor to that because coming up, we've got our um, annual staff uh, human resources report, which I'll be giving this year <laughs> um, because of some personnel. And I, I wanted to really highlight this because this is an area that I don't think we've highlighted too much in the past about how um, this whole process really works and how we work in our system to hold teachers to high standards for uh, teaching in our classroom and what we do to support leaders to make sure that um, that's happening. So I wanted to mention that other than that, um, I had the opportunity on Friday to be a guest speaker for the WSU Tri-Cities uh, Superintendent uh, Certification Program, so that was very fun uh, to go and be their best speaker, or their guest speaker, not their best speaker. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you were Freudian slip there. Um, their guest speaker is what I meant to say. Um, but other than that, I... I um, have had to kind of not do um, too many class or school visits over the past couple of weeks because I didn't know if I would have jury duty. I was on call for jury duty for the last two weeks and I had to call in the Friday before. So I didn't want to schedule things and then have to reschedule. I didn't end up having to go to jury duty, uh, but, um, but because of some other reasons, I was disappointed that I didn't get to go to the Coral Festival on Monday, Tuesday, but it is available online and through YouTube. So if anybody else, had to miss that as well. I would um, encourage you to watch it online. And then I just also wanted to finally mention that tonight is the KSD student job fair. It just started, it's being held from six to eight at Kennewick High School. All students are welcome, it's free and that's a great opportunity for students to learn about uh, summer job, after school activity or after school job opportunities, um, post-graduation entry level jobs and just start to build some relationships with business community. So uh, that's happening right now. We can't go because we're here, but <laughs> I wanted to mention it. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Mike. Uh, so I'm going to jump on the job fair as well. I've gone to it the last several years and when I saw it was going on tonight, I'm like, well, that's no good. I want to <laughs> actually, I actually really like it. We had a really nice turnout and great, great participation here from local businesses. Uh, so I believe I told both my children they had to go. They didn't have a choice. They need to get off the dad's payroll here. I'm tired of paying for it. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about real quickly is varsity tutors. I know that also is a program that's coming to an end. Uh, but I do have to say that both my both of my kids have used it and has, has done very well for both of them. Uh, they just struggled with some stuff and varsity tutors stepped up and they did a very nice job. And I also give varsity tutors, I give them credit because they saw that my daughter had completed, you know, didn't need them anymore. And they kept calling me, you know, we, 
we can take it back. If she needs more help, you just tell her, just, just call us. So they're certainly hustling for hours. So there's no lack of effort on their part. But uh, anyway, they did do a nice job for both my kids. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Dr. Miller? Uh, yeah, first of all, congratulations to all those students who came uh, today and uh, participated and, and did so well in athletics. It was fun to see how amazing our bowling is in this area, in this district. That's impressive. We basically, we, we took both 4A and 3A. That's amazing. Um, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go to the Coral Festival, uh, seeing all these elementary school students uh, perform and, and the, the wonderful job their music teachers are doing. Um, I think music is, is, is great in helping uh, kids find a voice and find uh, different avenues of, of exploring art and exploring emotion. Um, it was it was really well done and it was a great performance um and uh it really enjoyed that um yeah uh, you know we continue to uh move forward with the subcommittee stuff and and also to mike's point i think varsity you know unfortunately with all the budget issues we've got these amazing programs like varsity tutors i think has been a great program but a huge benefit and certainly we need to look for ways maybe ways we can partnership with community uh, community groups and, and different organizations to, to try to fill these gaps that we may have. Um, because certainly uh, things like tutors and, and mental health counselors are, are things that I think provide enormous benefit and, and help big picture. And so trying to find avenues to, to make that work is certainly a priority. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Brittany. Yeah, so no school visits for the last couple weeks. I know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be working with Tracy to get the last of them scheduled mm -hmm. after spring break. So I don't have any of those to report on, but I did um, week before last. I was invited to meet with a group of school counselors and just go over some of their um, priorities and just wanting wanting to make sure that there was a board member that kind of had an ear out for some of their concerns and um, just some things that they'd like to. See stay have stay so uh, BJ Wilson from the district in um, accompanied me on that meeting and it was it was great so I have some information I have to give back to them so I will be reporting soon um, I attended the Amon Creek PTO meeting which I have never attended a PTO meeting before so it was great I want to want to begin learning a little bit about how the PTOs work I think there's a lot of potential there for partnering with our community, particularly as we're getting closer to levies and bonds, et cetera. I'd like to kind of explore our opportunity to partner a little more directly with them as a board with the PTOs. So uh, I got a wonderful phone call from Representative uh, Connors last week. And I, uh, she has done a little bit of footwork for us on some available funding for mental health. And so I will forward that information to you, Tracy, so we can start looking at it. But she had quite a list of things that are potential opportunities for us. So uh, I also attended the fifth grade uh, Coral Fest Monday night. Uh, it was wonderful. I, my fourth child is a fifth grader and I don't know how I hadn't been to one before because I have three others that we should have been there for. I don't know how we missed it, but <laughs> it was wonderful. And I'm definitely going to make sure that I'm there um, when my second grader makes it through. So really had a great time there, was really impressed with all of the choirs. Uh, those fifth graders are so endearing and it was just so fun to see them because you could definitely see that several of them, when the high school choir came in, they could make the connection and say, oh, that's where I'm heading with this. So very fun to see. Uh, and then just about an hour ago, hour and a half ago, I was at the all middle school track meet at Horse Heaven Hills in the rain. Uh, it was canceled, unfortunately, so we didn't get a chance to, to to see that. So hopefully that'll be rescheduled here in the next little bit. Thank you, Brittany. Micah. Yeah, so uh, I was able to go to a, I was had the opportunity to go to a leadership conference over the weekend. Um, uh, there's a board members from all, the, all across the state. That was really kind of neat to meet them and kind of talk about you know the unique challenges that we have in common and kind of brainstorm ideas and things like that it was also our my my, my wife and i are 23rd anniversary so i had to talk her into going with me um she initially was not very didn't think that was the best anniversary but we pulled it off um 
Um, I got to meet. I had a, a, a really nice meeting with Skyler Rude this uh, this last week. Talked about uh, a number of a number of different things. Um, the new, you know, the new bills that have passed and a couple of the challenges that he um, sees. He got a lot of updates leg- on the legislative side of things. It was kind of um, it was really neat meet uh, meet with him again. Um, communicated with some people across the state about uh, they're running for different offices, city council and stuff like that on the, on the west side. That was kind of neat to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I also had this really cool opportunity to uh, organize some fundraisers for uh, a whole bunch of kids, uh, probably about like mm, close to 100 kids this weekend um, or the, this, this this week and met with multiple different groups and um, helped them with with fundraising ideas for their stuff. And, um, and then I had a community member kind of a I want to touch base with you guys about this, but I had a community member who watched the meeting a couple of meetings ago about the financial literacy and approached me and uh, mentioned some uh, uh, some programs that are free that we could potentially look into. So um, this week I'm going to con- make that connection. Um, you know, obviously it's it's, it's kind of hard to, to do things when, when you, you want to do a lot. You want to do everything for everybody, right? But there's these bound, these binds that, that are on you. So trying to figure out ways to work with the community and, and programs, that's important. So I really appreciate that um, members be reaching out to me. And then last thing I just want to say to everybody who's maybe listening is, um, you know, I mean, we have not a lot, a lot of people here, but we had some so several people speak. So I just want to encourage people, if you do speak, to stay and listen, at least to this this part. I mean, you know, we work really hard and trying to be transparent. And we've talked a number of times about how we can um, you know, we, we want people to if they have if they say something that we want that them to feel heard and get an answer. And so, you know, I know Tracy spends a lot of time putting things together and, and answering questions. And and so I just would encourage if, if you do speak, please stay and listen, because um, lots of times there's an answer coming about something that happened a week or two ago. So I just want to encourage people to do that. And and without a yield. Thank you. Um, I will be quick. Had a couple conversations with a few different teachers uh, over, the, over the last two weeks um, who've been following along with our meetings, um, just providing their um, input from, from the classroom. Um, the other thing that's come up, and I, I don't know if this is the right exact time for it or questioning, but um, I've had two teachers reach out because of lice issues in their class. And my understanding of the conversation is we just, I mean, we all essentially don't do anything. We don't like, I don't want to say separate the child, but it, like, I don't know the protocol for it, but it, it seems interesting that if kids have lice, we don't notify people like, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know the protocol for it. I just thought it was interesting that um, it's just kind of, we depend on the parents to take care of it, but it's, You've got 30 kids in the classroom. And, and so anyways, and now everybody's skin's crawling. I'm sorry, but it just was, it, it came up twice in the last two weeks. So I, I wanted to yeah. I, put I that will, on your radar. I'll follow up and All give right. you some information on okay. the LICE protocol. Thank you. Yeah. All right, moving on. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, end on that, right? Um, one thing, it sounds like we're going to have to do a board meeting at the Mike and Kennewick uh bowling oh, match sure. next yeah. year 100 percent, and it probably will rival the football game so we'll have to check that out yeah, um, all right so moving on reports and discussions we're going to jump to the 2024 20, 25 preliminary budget mr vic roberts yeah, the hour We get the computer up there. Yeah, that works fast. That feels pretty snappy. <laughs> I didn't even get to my screen. So, okay, we're going to take a break from the general fund. We're still uh, working on uh, working through that. The OSPI has given us a little more information this week, and uh, the governor still has to sign the budget, yes, uh, to March 30th. So, we'll pick up a couple of these other funds the uh, transportation debt service. So no decision really tonight, just uh, some informational here on the uh, fiscal uh, of those two funds. And so we're going to talk about transportation debt service. We'll pick up the general fund again. We'll do another capital projects one before um, that's finalized. And then ASB 
and then it's self-insured uh, over the next couple months. <laughs> so the transportation vehicle fund, uh, generally it's, it's funded through bus depreciation. Buses are depreciated over 13 years. And um, we, we try to estimate that. We don't get our final numbers till really uh, quite a bit later uh, in the year. But uh, transportation director uh, April Heiser is going to talk to you about purchasing some buses for delivery summer 2025. So we have to order pretty early um, just to get uh, on the list and get a good price and make sure we can get them. Um, it takes over a year and a half to actually get the buses. So here's the fund uh, the adopted budget this year, 23, 24, and then we have uh, projected. So the cash uh, fund balance was pretty close. And you can see here the uh, bus depreciation is 1.578 million. At the time we do the budget, we estimate, um, but the uh, state did some inflation adjustments. So we got a little more than we expected for this year. And then we're budgeting 1.5 million for next year. And we won't know that until next fall, what that number really is. So hopefully it'll be a little bit higher. And then uh, buses purchased for summer 2024, which were ordered a year ago, uh, 1.59 million there. Those will be coming in August. And that leaves about $550,000. And then um, depreciation, we're estimating 1.5 million. Nine buses, uh, what April's gonna talk to you about, about 1.8 million there. And we'll have some money left to, again, probably purchase six to eight buses a year is what we've been targeting. Uh, eventually, the state's trying to phase out diesel buses, um, but as long as we can still buy them, that's what we plan on doing. So that's, and we have, we're supposed to do a four-year budget. The state requires us when we adopt the budget to have kind of a four-year outlook. And um, so we've projected some depreciation and some more bus, bus purchases. So any questions there on the transportation fund? Just really quick. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about this with the with the bus purchase, but um, you've talked about the electric vehicles briefly. I mean, from what the cost they show, we're looking at half a million dollars a bus. That's correct. How do we even do that? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, we, uh, we you know, there, there's got that, got that pulled up. Okay. There's grants <laughs> and different uh, money out there, but none of it really um, comes close to covering the infrastructure costs and, and all sorts of other things that come with it. Yeah. There's been some school yeah. districts, you know, apply for those grants. A couple have, uh, you know, turned them back in and some have done some things. But, um, you know, we've talked to the PUD about some things and they really are, are kind of like, you know, you, you just need to wait, you know, and so instead of getting way too far out ahead of it. Uh, the bus, uh, people that sell the buses, they really try to push it. I think they've heard enough from April and I that, you know, we're, we're pretty much, you know, not not in the mood to buy anything we don't have to right now. So uh, she can touch on that a little more. And then uh, so the debt service fund, uh, this is the fund, you know, basically if you have a mortgage or something. This is what we do when we pass bonds and build schools. We have to have enough money in here to make the payments. And uh, so you see here 2324, we have a beginning. Uh, well, the beginning is 8.7 million, then the taxes that come in, and that's on the, you know, your property tax statements. We figure out, uh, you know, how much principal bond interest that, that needs to be paid during the year, and then, you know, get those uh, uh, tax uh, amounts to the, the county. We, you know, the board approves the budget, and that's how the property taxes get uh, onto the tax rolls. So you see for 24-25, the taxes go up a little bit, 18.5 million. And then here's the, the bonds that we have to pay, the principal amount, 12, 12 million, and then the interest, 6 million. And these numbers come from this chart basically here. Uh, the numbers are close. Uh, principal outstanding, 24, 25, there's 12 million. And the interest is about 6 million. And if you go back here, 12 million, 6 million. So, so that's where those numbers come from. Um, and then going on out the years, so some debt rolls off the books here in um, you know, 25, 26, 26, 27, and that's why there's a, a decrease here in the amount of cash we need because we just don't need as much money for the principal payment. Any questions there on that uh, chart? And then uh, some of the information here. So there's some compliance. 
you know, a district can't just go run bonds. They have to meet to have the capacity to do that. So we have plenty of capacity. I mean, this means that you could run a bond for over $500 million. Uh, you know, it costs too much for voters to pass, but uh, we're in good shape there for the future for being able to, uh, you know, run future bonds. And you see tax history and, and just the various information there. So any questions on those two funds or the debt service fund? And uh, these numbers really won't change for the budget. Those will be the numbers pretty much in the uh, June uh, budget document. So we'll continue on in April, get uh, back to general fund and, and work on that. Great, you're right. good. Thanks, Rick. Right. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks. All, right. All right, next up. Asset preservation and capital projects update. Update. Ryan Jones, sir, good to see you. See you as well. Good evening, Dr. Pierce, members of the board. So this is the annual asset preservation uh, program uh, update as well as uh, capital projects update. Because we had some projects that we completed since the last time I was here, and we also have some that are kind of coming on deck. So <clears throat> so this is uh, basically right, the asset. Can you go back? Like Absolutely. I know I can't sure. for because we just started doing okay. this, but um, but uh, just just to give a little bit of context, this is we're um, required to report this information to the board. Um, there's not really a decision that's needed. We're just required to present the information. But certainly, you know, if you have questions Absolutely. on the information that uh, Ryan presents, that's great. And then you're going to see an updated capital a 10 year capital facility plan uh, at, uh, that on May 8th. And so a lot of this information around um, building scores and so forth helps to inform that 10 year capital facility plan, which eventually helps inform a future bond measure. So kind of connecting the dots between <laughs> between okay. presentations. But Thank you. thanks, Ryan. Sorry. Sure. About that. No, not a problem. So uh, so once again, this is a state requirement for any construction that was SCAP funded, so state construction assistance program. So this was passed in 1994 and it basically requires us to score these buildings on an annual basis. And it's really it was a state's way to ensure that we're protecting their investment. And we're you know maintaining our assets. So you know, districts that use SCAP money to build a building and they don't invest anything in it in the 30 year span between uh, eligibilities, they score, they have potential to score so low that they will no longer be eligible for SCAP funding because that shows that, you know, they failed to, to help protect the state investment and make that local investment as well. So this is, uh, like I said, this was passed in uh, 1993. Our, our building was first spec was 1994. But we really score all of our buildings uh, across the district. So, because we just find it's a best practice and a good way to target uh, capital projects. So, kind of an explanation of the scores. Excellent is 100%. So, of course, that'd be brand new construction, new infrastructure, foundations, everything. Uh, good, you know, uh, is about 90%. Fair is 62, and poor is 30. So, you have to stay above 60. So, really, as long as you're in that fair range, you know, you're doing okay as far as eligibility for SCAP funding. You fall into the poor range, which is thirty percent. You know, you have to actually make some improvements to even get your score above sixty in order to be eligible. So, um, that's kind of a breakdown. But as we go through uh, the numbers, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. So, uh, these are the buildings that are actually tied to the asset preservation program bylaw, you know, post nineteen ninety three construction. These are the ones the state specifically are looking for, require us to uh, update and report to you. But as I mentioned, we report all of our buildings. Here's kind of an example of, of how these scores uh, can move up or down. Uh, this was Southridge High School. So uh, a number of years ago, they were in 2020, they were identified as having, he's basically being like uh, fair, 62% on their heating and cooling uh, uh, air handlers and whatnot. So what we ended up doing was part of the addition project is we 
replace those air handlers with brand new air handlers. So of course that drove their score up to 100% basically brand new. Since then it's kind of degraded kind of quickly just because there is a lot of existing duct work and, and louvers and things like that, their original construction that are tied to those brand new air handlers, but it's still scoring 90% now that we've made that local investment. <clears throat> so once again there you can see where it scored 62 and then it went up to 100. So here is a uh, entire summary of the entire district of all the scoring that we do. Uh, it's getting harder to fit on one page. So what I ended up doing was just kind of uh, focusing on on different sections. We basically have uh, three three main categories. We have these buildings here, which are obviously they're still well above, you know, the, the state requirement, but they are our older oldest buildings. And as you can see, they are scoring in kind of the uh, fair to good range. So. Moving on, these are buildings that are really just underneath good, uh, you know, scoring in the eight, eight, mid to 80s. As you can see, each building, like for instance, Kamiakin, it, it goes by building. So as you see, the 700 building, which is a brand new addition, scores 100%, whereas the other buildings that were part of the, uh, the campus originally are more in the 80s. So, and they'll, they'll have different SCAP tracks as far as their funding and which areas and square footage is eligible at certain times. So that's just kind of how the state tracks and how they build that out and then you'll see here this is much of our new construction that uh, you know in the last 15 years or so so still scoring very high uh, they're doing very well uh, materials seem to be holding up especially even the, the cookie cutters you know some of those 2010 uh, builds they seem to be doing well and still scoring very well so are there any questions about the, the scores so Ryan what's the the depreciation schedule of these Buildings is it 30 years, 40 years? I can't remember what it was. So the, the SCAP funding is is 30 years. 30 it's years. Uh, so from board acceptance date, it's 30 years till it's eligible again. And that's very important. It's board acceptance date, not substantial completion of the project. So you'll see sometimes a building will be completed and maybe acceptance is sometimes even uh, looking back, it's been two years after. Sometimes that could be because of legal issues. Maybe they're still hashing out some because some some points of contention during during construction and there's still some some money issues to be figured out so of course it's not in the board's interest to accept it at that point so that's why sometimes it won't match up exactly with when it was finished in construction if that makes sense any further questions all right so moving on so capital projects update so ridgeview elementary of course uh came online uh, I hope I know some of you were able to attend the uh, the ribbon cutting and I'm sure some of you've been able to tour it since so uh, checked in with them today everything's going really well we uh, got commissioning process is almost complete we've got all our air balancing done uh, we've been uh, following up on envelope testing especially around the windows uh, right now we're in what's the warranty phase so essentially anything that comes up that is that we basically determined was uh, an issue during construction or workmanship and things like that you know we forward those to general contractor they've been extremely responsive they'll be there over spring break kind of wrapping up some issues that are a little more invasive that we hold off because we don't want to impact school instruction during the year so uh they'll be school district will be off next week but they'll be working so right. but uh right yes did, uh did we was there a solution to the break room office opening or is that down is that just further down the road we're really trying to just kind of it's, it's further down the road for sure okay. if okay. if we were to do anything we'd obviously do that like during non-school like day, a summer, like a summer job gotcha. uh we are continuing to monitor it you know we kind of we did do some uh in anticipation of this we did do some sheet uh some sheet right. sheet rock work sorry uh at during construction to make it easier to make any kind of modifications there so uh and, and really have minimal impact on finishes so we are kind of ready for that if it comes to that but we're, we're really kind of trying to figure out if it really is that big of an issue gotcha um we, we have could also try some because i understand one of the major concerns is, is sound transference and there are some materials that we can put in there to maybe help reduce that um but ultimately we we have options yeah to go either way so any further questions about ridgeview or hopefully everybody's has everybody been able to see it yet Oh, very good. And if, if any time you'd like to, you know, go get a look, you know, just contact me and we can make sure to, to get you in there. <clears throat> now, looking forward, we have the TriTech core modernization. So this was recently funded uh, ahead, of, ahead of schedule, which is good. 
but uh, as you can see, it's gonna it basically involves the uh, original 1981 area construction, which is highlighted in green there. So the architect that was selected was Design West, and they've done a number of the projects at TriTech, so they're very familiar with the site, very familiar with the systems. And this is going to be probably one of the more complex things we've done in a while at this site because it is currently occupied space. It's going to probably be multiple phases. Got to, uh, we are still trying to determine what that looks like as far as, you know, st are students going to be there? Are they going to be off site? So we got some things to work out there, but uh, once again, we're, we're looking at all that. Um, but uh, yeah, t if it's going to be occupied site, obviously the toughest thing is, you know, you have to keep HVAC, electrical, all that stuff online, and you take certain areas offline. How are you interrupting those services? How do you restore those services? So just a lot of moving pieces. Engineers are going to be uh, pretty busy. So, uh, but as you see, it's a $45 million project, and uh, we're really early stage of design. Basically, programming is complete. We're kind of entering schematic, and design development will be next. And then we'll be hit the 85% construction drawings, followed by the complete drawings. So about a year from now, we'll be ready to start probably putting out the bid. So. And, and just a reminder, as the we're the fiscal agent and host district for TriTech, so we're you know Ryan and his crew and um, mm -hmm. you know are managing the construction project but the funding for the project is this does not come through our own local bond funding or it, it's nothing that our local voters um, are funding this money comes directly to skill centers from the legislature so Correct. just want to remind everybody no, of that where thank the money comes from thank, thank you for that I was going to yes. say the same thing thank you yeah for yes that. yeah and uh, you know they really have a very engaged uh, administration at, at TriTech, and, and you know they do a very good job. And we, we really operate in a support role for them uh, on these types of projects. So, are there any? And as you can see, they're going to add a couple of programs: uh, HVAC residential, pre-farm tech, with with this you know addition and some reorganization. So, any further questions on TriTech? Any any questions for Ryan at all? All right, you're fantastic. Free. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. All right, so moving along, we have no unfinished business. So we will get into new business. And up next is transportation, annual bus purchase. April Heiser, you are up. It's good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> you know, if I'm here, I'm asking for money. Yep. <laughs> So yes, welcome April. This is April's annual uh, presentation and this one um, is a decision needed from the board uh, because in addition to sharing just an update on transportation, uh, we're seeking board approval for bus purchase plan. So with that, thanks for being here April and I'll hand it over to you. Perfect. Good evening, everybody. I'm April Heiser, the Transportation Director. I thought I'd just start out by going over some of our staffing information. We currently have 126 bus drivers. Um, we have 39 bus attendants that work on our special needs routes, as well as our preschool, our KDC and ECAP routes. Seven mechanics, five of them work on our buses and two work on our motor pool fleet that we have. One shop foreman, Board dispatchers who do all the dispatching with the buses and also do all of the routing for the department. Two secretaries, a coordinator, an assistant, and myself. Every year we have to report information to the state for our funding. So every day all of our drivers are counting students as they're getting off and on the buses. And as you can see, we're pretty consistent on running just over 10,600 kids on our buses daily. Last year, our drivers drove over 2.1 million miles and almost 1.9 getting kids to and from school. And then you can see our field trip extracurricular and our summer school miles for last year. Our fleet summary, right now we have 139 buses on our fleet and are expecting to get the eight buses that you approved last year sometime in August or September. And out of those 139 buses, 121 of them are currently on our depreciation schedule. So we are receiving revenue for those. 
All buses are either categorized as a type A, B, C, or D, and types A and B are buses that are 16 passengers or less. And so we purchase all type C and D category buses, the larger capacity um, buses, and those take 13 years for the state to completely reimburse us for just the base cost of the bus without any options. So some of the options that we put on buses, the Insta chains, camera systems, the air conditioning right now, um, we don't get reimbursed for any of those options that we add on to the buses. So the state really looks at this particular category, C or D, as 13 years, and that is the lifespan of a bus, um, in their opinion, and that's how they they reimburse us. So right now we have 12.9% of our buses off of the depreciation schedule. Those are completely paid off as far as the state is concerned. We typically will keep buses in service anywhere from 18 to 20 years. Just some of the older ones are our spares. They're not on routes every single day, um, but they're there in case we need something. We will be requesting to surplus nine buses this year that were built between uh, 2004 and 2006. So a little bit about changes in the electric vehicle mandate that was supposed to happen in 2026. That's changed a little bit. So right now, currently, state and federal grants are currently closed, but we expect them to reopen in the fall. And the change before, when I talked last year, um, it was going to be from 2026, you would be required to purchase zero emission vehicles. And that's changed. The new law that went through requires OSPI and Department of Ecology to create a method to determine the total cost of ownership. So that's the total cost of ownership over 13 years. And so for an electric bus, that would include the cost of the bus, infrastructure, charging, maintenance, replacing batteries and disposing of them if you needed to. They'll also be doing a total cost of ownership for a diesel bus. So when the cost of owning an electric vehicle is determined to be at or below owning um, a diesel bus at that point, then we'll have to move over to zero emissions. And they really do not know how long that's going to take. So I did look up on the district or on the OSPI website for the cost of an electric bus. Shetke's selling them this year for just over 524,000. And we would be reimbursed for 393. So April, real quick, if I may ask, is that is that including the, um, is that part of the grant or is that just what the OSPI would reimburse us for? That would be just what's, so it'll be, it'll depend on what grants come back open in the fall. We don't know what those are gonna look like. Okay. Um, so this is strictly what OSPI would reimburse for just the basic cost of an electric bus. Okay, gotcha, without, okay, without grants, all right. Without, yep, without okay. grants, options, anything. Dr. Pierce. April, also, I I'm wanted to get with you before the presentation, but I it slipped my mind until now. Um, the regional transportation, uh, person from OSPI mm -hmm. uh, presented at our um, ESD superintendents meeting last week. And by the way, I wanted to say he said very complimentary things about you and uh -huh. um, how fortunate we are in Kennewick to have you. And I agree with him. Thank you. <laughs> so appreciate that. He mentioned also the cost of batteries. Um, and I, I was thinking he said they're like $9,000 or something like that. Do you recall? I don't you, know exactly what the cost is okay. for a battery. Okay. I can find out. I can. We can talk about that, but I just know that's another part of that total cost of ownership um, that it, in terms of the superintendents in the room we were talking about really needing to make sure that gets included because they're extraordinarily expensive, and I don't know at what, 9, you know, I don't know how often you have to, have to um, replace them, but that's another piece of this we just want to make sure we're tracking yeah i'm not yeah. sure that they have enough school buses that are electric out there to know the answer to how long they're supposed to last mm -hmm. thank you so i know that they were going to put replacing batteries and the disposal of batteries in the total cost mm -hmm. of ownership okay and i mean i could be way under I, it was either like it was either nine thousand or nine 90,000. I mean, I think it was more like that. I, 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 I'll follow up. Yeah. 
it was enough that you were. It was a lot. Yeah, it was enough that you caught your <laughs> Shocking. attention. Shocking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are really expensive. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I, oh, go ahead. I wish, yeah. I can, I, we got questions at the end, right? We can, sure. we can ask, yeah. Sure. Okay, so air conditioning, the priority still remains the same to purchase enough buses with air conditioning to support our summer school programs. Um, with the eight buses that are coming in in August or September, that'll give us 15 on the fleet. So the target is 25 to 30. Um, and we arrived at that number by going back and looking at how many routes that we ran prior to COVID. This slide shows how many buses we've purchased over the last 10 years. And just a reminder for the people on the board in 2018, we doubled the amount of buses that we purchased due to the walk zone at all of the middle schools moving from two miles down to one. So we needed extra buses to do that work. So I am requesting uh, the board's approval tonight to purchase nine uh, buses <clears throat> to be delivered in August or September of 2025. That money would come from next year's budget, which Vic talked about. Um, we're projected to have about 550,000 after we pay for the eight buses that come in this summer. And then we are expecting about 1.5 million to be um, deposited into the TBF from the depreciation payment that we get. So we should have just over 2 million in my TVF before these buses arrive. Okay. Awesome. So uh, I will entertain a motion and then we'll open it up for discussion questions. I'll move to uh, grant the request for the money to replace the buses. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Questions. Oh. I have a couple of questions regarding the. I mean, a, a few slides back, you, you talked about the the total costs for an electric bus that includes all the different elements of it, right? I, I'm just I'm just wondering if you have like any sort of estimates or cost breakdowns within that. I mean, like, what number is that? we're gonna have to like look at or swallow because I mean it seems like retrofitting the entire yard is going to be something in the power group you know and so that's, my first thing is just that do you have any idea that, I do not we've been talking to the salesman at check key um, he's it's there's a lot of different components that go into that when you're looking at the yeah. infrastructure in the fleet and my assumption would be you would be doing blocks of the infrastructure at a time. So like you would be planning for 10 buses and doing infrastructure for those 10 buses. And then later on, you'd continue to add, you know, more charging stations at that point. But we don't know what it would cost us to run the electric into our facility. We've not sat down and talked to, you know, Benton County. So we just don't know what the total cost would be for right now. Okay, that that knocked out a, a, several of my questions. Um, power grid? Have you talked to the the Ken, uh, You know the the city. Do they feel like the power grid is just fine to handle that, or is there any we've city not, planning there as well? We've not gone that far yet. I know I've talked to Eric and Vic, so it's on our radar of. Mm -hmm. of things to do, but we don't have any solid costs for you. I, I can share just anecdotally from some of our um, neighboring districts, and Vic alluded to it, that um, they applied for a grant, and this isn't our immediate neighbors, these are more our rural neighbors, but, uh, and then discovered that the cost of getting the access to the electricity whether the transfer station or whatever they couldn't it, it, they they couldn't afford to do that so they had to return the grant money so there's a lot of mm -hmm. that kind of yeah, level of work that has to has yeah, to happen one of my worries is honestly like like what tracy said like you know the batteries you know like just for not knowing or kind of not knowing what you don't know and then going into this thing and then there's <laughs> there's there's fees or big big expense that we just didn't look at like for example like oh we built this thing and like oh well actually the city can't actually even provide that kind of power to us or something like that right or yeah these batteries are 
every so often or the range. Okay, now mm -hmm. I would have the range to actually take certain trips. And so I'm just stuff like that, you know, I, I, and I know that this is very early on, but I would just uh, encourage you. I'm sure you already are, mm -hmm. but I'd encourage you to kind of think about every T and, dot and I, right? So. Yes, and I've, I've been talking to the director over at Pasco. They have electric buses. I've talked to the director over in Walla Walla. He's got electric buses. He just got more grant money and ordered 15 more. Um, so I'm kind of learning information from oh, them on some of their challenges that they've had. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, if we're getting, you know, we're, we're looking like we're going to have to go that direction at some point. Um, Shetke Northwest does have people within their business that will come out and help oversee that and help cost that out for us. Okay. But that's really that not, time. I mean, that's, it seems to me that's a considerable amount of time in the future that will be required to do it, given that the state still needs to do a study on the total cost and that we won't be, are they? Well, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, no, no, you remember, so, this, so the bill they put through, I mean, they were gonna force it down our throat this yeah. year. Right. So what I don't want to do is I, I want to be really clear. I think good electric buses are probably five to 10 years down the road where they have the distance, the power and the infrastructure or the, the ability to do what we want them to do to truly replace a diesel bus. But regardless, this state is going to continue to force this on us. Yeah. And so we need to be prepared and, and get ahead of this curve as quickly as we can, because if we don't, we're going to left hold in the bag. And so it. I, again, I want to be really clear. I, I don't think they're quite viable yet. Right. But. But it's on the horizon. It's on the horizon, yeah. and and we need to be really excited that it wasn't shut down our throat. Because otherwise, we'd be having to pay and do yeah. the infrastructure without the grant money. And again, buying the buying the bus is the cheapest thing we're going to do. Mm -hmm. You go bring in the type of power you need. You're talking about a substation worth of power <laughs> to come in and drive the power. Oh, yeah, I know it's crazy. It's astronomically huge. So it's it's a big big deal. Again, the buses will be the cheapest thing we do, and they're not cheap. And yeah. they're not cheap. Yeah. I mean, you're thinking, like you're saying, power to 130 buses and power stations. That's it's man. It's literally substation level power draw. So it's monstrous. To your point. So anyway, I just we just need to be thinking about it. So the other question I had actually is not anybody else have questions about electrical. The electrical buses. No, I, I have some questions that aren't related to the electric buses. Um, all of the you said that a there's A, B, C, and D buses, correct? And we're just getting C and D. And what size were those again? Those are a 77 passenger bus. Okay. Just out of curiosity, why don't we have any of the smaller buses? Due to the amount of kids that we have on them. Would it be beneficial? For example, I've seen different sporting event you know extracurricular things where you'll have uh, a 77 passenger bus driving to the west side with 10 people um is would it have we ever done a cost analysis that it might be beneficial to have two or three smaller buses that that would be used specifically for extracurricular activities that would you know if they're going to spokane or if they're going to walla walla or whatever with 10 people we don't need to take a 77 passenger bus. Again, we don't need a whole fleet, but maybe two, three, four, uh, running some type of cost analysis to see if that might be beneficial. Have we done that? The costs between a type A and a type C are not that much difference. And the cost per mile, you're not getting, um, there's not much difference between the small bus versus the right. large bus. Okay. Most of the schools right now, if they're running 10 kids or less, are taking vans or okay. Suburbans. So so yeah. we've looked into it, it sounds yes. like. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to see if that had been looked into. Yeah. And just one quick question. I, we had a presentation a couple of meetings ago, maybe last meeting, or maybe with public comments, that we we're making some changes to our summer school programming. Is that correct? And so do, do your summer school numbers take into account the changes that we're making to summer school? As far as how many routes we'll right. have? Right, yeah. I know this year they're going to have less routes, but we've not gotten, um, I know which schools they're going to yet, but I don't know how many kids we're going to be transporting. Mm -hmm. So schools are still gathering that information. Okay. 
and along the line with that, with the changes in the districting of the the elementary schools, does that change our needs in terms of buses numbers or? We have enough buses to be able to do that work. Um, most of the, the changes are neighborhood changes, okay. so, so it's not huge changes for us other than rerouting a lot of buses to go into different neighborhoods to take them to different schools. Okay. Anything else before I, I got two quick things look. Um, real quick one, what's the best time like what's the best time or um, situation for one of us to visit? I think Mike's been to the department, but is it like like 6 a.m. you come in and it's like you can see like the magic happen and the routers are doing all this <laughs> or is it like better to come a little bit later? I'm just curious what if, if you want to have a, a good sit down conversation, it's probably the middle of the, the day. Middle of the day. If you want to see the action, you want to come in about 3.30. In the oh, morning. 3.30. Oh, mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> OK, all right. that's that's when we're taking home all of our elementary kids and it's it's busy. Gotcha. OK, all right. We'll, we'll work on that. Um, the second thing I have, not not really a question, just a statement because we've been talking about budget and all that all this stuff. Um, my first meeting when you when we approved purchasing buses, they were $152,000 with AC. We're looking at $195,000 right now. So in two years, we're spending over a quarter million dollars more just to purchase some some of the same buses. So just again, when we talk about budget, everybody look at the cost of these things and the and the different laws and all the stuff that are being passed. It, it impacts us at all levels. So, so actually along those lines, since we're just talking here, um, if they, I mean, Mike, if they were to pass any type of electric vehicle law, would they grandfather in all of the diesels that currently exist? Yes. If they did, would it be to our benefit right now <laughs> to, load up. to load up? And, and I, I mean, I'm serious because it could potentially give us a window. Actually, a good idea. Uh, give us a window that we're a little bit more flexible. Where I mean, we've already said the costs here could be potentially enormous, and and would it would it potentially be in our best interest? And also speaking to inflation, I don't see things getting cheaper in the future. No, would it potentially be to our advantage to make a bigger purchase knowing that yes we're putting <laughs> some money up front and, and maybe Vic is excited about this question story. yeah <laughs> if the answer is no then there's so so money, money in the budget and that's the problem yeah. in that pool if but, we were flush with cash then but, maybe but. but would it be beneficial to take money from somewhere else perhaps in the knowing that this could save us significant money down the road or do you think it's not worth it? We run into a bit of a budget crunch. Okay. If things get better or something, you can always try to move money. That's how those 20 buses got purchased. Money was transferred. Yeah. But we had a lot more back then. Okay. I think it was a good. I, th I think for sure that's something that we'll end up watching once the uh, Department of Ecology and OSBI figure out total cost of ownership. We can kind of start seeing how long it might be before we're forced into electric. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You know, the other thing that occurred to me, April, and I don't remember them addressing it at the meeting uh, where I was, but what are they saying is the total cost of, of owning a diesel bus? Like, what is, what are they? What methodology are they using for that? Do you know? And that's part of that law that came through, right? This new bill that came through that passed. Part of it is oh, OSPI. so they don't have methodology for that part of it. I was thinking nope, they knew how either. much they could say. Here's what the total cost of a diesel bus is, and we have to figure out what the total cost of a electric bus is. But they haven't done either. Correct. Got it. So they'll have to do both. Okay. So when they do the diesel, you know, they'll put in what they project to be cost for maintenance and oil changes, repairs, all of it. Okay. Great. Any other questions? No, but can I make a comment? That's sure. Kind of, it's related for sure. I just want to tell you, you're doing a great job. I, um, <laughs> through in the course of my parenting and having kids ride the bus to and from school, I've had more than a handful of occasions to call the transportation department because a kid's gotten on the wrong bus or 
um, they didn't come home when I was expecting them to, or maybe we needed or wanted, to, we've requested changes to routes. And I always have 100% confidence that someone's going to answer the phone at the transportation office and that they will address my concern almost immediately. Um, so I've just been always very, very impressed and have told friends and coworkers that if they've ever had a problem, I just say, just call the transportation office. They are so good. They will take care of it. And so you're doing a really great job. Thank you. I'll show that with my staff. Yeah. Yes, please do. All right. Well, thank you, um, April. We have a finish up here. We have a first and a second for um, the recommendation to authorize transportation director to order nine buses for delivery in the summer 2025. There's no further questions. Mm -hmm. Patty, I'll have you call for the roll call vote. Mr. Connors. Yes. Dr. Miller. Yes. Ms. Gledhill. Yes. Mr. Valentine. Yes. And Mr. Galbraith. Yes. Thank you. As an air conditioner guy, I remember the AC thing. Yes, I remember that. I voted no last time because of the eight. It was the air conditioning question that I didn't have answered. One guy that wanted all the kids to walk to school. A couple of months. <laughs> Next up, uh, K through five math adoption recommendation, Alyssa. Thank yeah, you. good evening, everyone. Um, it's my honor to be here tonight to talk about our um, math curriculum and the adoption um, and share with you. Um, this is, uh, we've been working on reviewing materials and we are here tonight because we have a material we'd like to recommend. Um, so we have a recommendation for the board um, and we're looking for that um, approval. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit of information about um, the math adoption. Uh, we did move it up. I'm going to explain that, that a little bit, um, a little bit about our process and why we landed on clear math for our math adoption and then a recommendation to approve it. Um, so in our strategic plan objectives, we did have an objective to review our math materials and make a recommendation for our new math materials at K-5. Um, so I just want to do a little walk down memory lane. Um, January 11th in 2023, there was a board retreat. Um, and at that meeting, we had some discussion about moving the math adoption up by three years. Um, we had some ESSER funds available. It was allowable to look at buying material, and we just are not pleased with our math outcomes. We've been talking about this at several of our meetings. Um, having a strong foundation starting in kindergarten is what's going to get us to those goals for algebra and success in high school. And we also just felt this year we had some capacity to take on an adoption. Typically, these take two years. And this one we um, we crunched together and did a little bit faster, but we just felt it was really important. Um, so just a reminder to the board, this is how we did it with our Smarter Balance Assessment in math last year. Um, and I think we all share an interest that we wanna do better. We want better outcomes for our students. And part of that is having um, the right curriculum to be working with. Uh, so uh, before the retreat, we weren't supposed to look at math materials until till 26, 27 and adopt them 27, 28, and then we would start using in 28, 29. Um, but with those ESSER funds being available, we talked with the board and said, can we move that up? Um, so we, uh, with that discussion and the board saying, yes, let's go. Uh, we started getting prepped last year so we could have um, a study and adoption this year and be ready to implement next year. Um, last meeting, we spent a little time on assessment and the importance of progress monitoring. We also talked a little bit about instruction and professional learning communities. There are three strategies we need to really get the student outcomes we need. Curriculum, instruction, and assessment. So this is really um, looking at this curriculum and making sure we have the right materials for math is what's really gonna be moving our students along with how it's taught and that we're looking at it and making adjustments to students all of the time. Um, so for the math adoption committee, 
Um, we, as soon as that study session was over, I worked on a posting and we actually had a teacher on special assignment for this um, adoption. And I'd like to just introduce Dave Elkins to the board. He really spearheaded and led this adoption. He is a veteran math teacher, instructional coach, and assistant principal for the district and has a passion for making sure we teach math correctly. Um, so we were delighted that he was interested in taking this important work on. Um, he gathered and selected over 94 teachers to participate. We had principals participating along with central staff. I'd also like to highlight I'm um, sitting next to Dave Tina Brewer, who before her role as director of professional development assessment was our science and math coordinator and deeply committed and invested in math instruction. And she was pivotal in supporting this adoption as well. Um, once we were narrowed down, we did have parents involved, and I'll talk about our parent preview in a couple minutes. So what we were looking for when we were going into this adoption, we wanted to be able, to, uh, we wanted to make sure the publisher would provide ongoing professional development, helping our teachers with how to teach math. We wanted it to be friendly as well to our uh, teachers. We want our curriculum to be parent friendly and understandable. Um, and then we want to make sure it's aligned with our state standards for math. So, um, we got our committee going in September. We were meeting twice a month, two, two and a half hours on Tuesdays. Um, these rooms were filled reviewing different materials. We started um, in the spring with about six, narrowed it down to four, and our teachers, those 94 teachers and administrators worked from September to February to really narrow down what would be the best material for um, our teachers and more importantly for our students. Um, we completed that and we were able to bring it to parents on February 12th to have an overview. Um, I've got some pictures I'm going to share of parents looking at the materials, giving us some feedback. And then it also was presented to the Instructional Materials Committee February 15th. Um, it's been on public display as well, and we are now completing our process that aligns with our policy to bring to the board. So we would like to recommend um, Carnegie Learning's Clear Math for our elementary math K-5. Um, some of the things we like about um, Carnegie Math is uh, that it's research driven. It's meaningful math learning. Our kids are going to have to think differently in math. It's going to grow mathematical thinkers. It's hard. It's going to make, it's going to push our kids. Um, it's research backed in its approaches. It has in intelligently developed lessons. It provides a deep understanding of math. It's just not about memorizing the answer. It's about understanding the mathematical concepts. Um, the tools are teacher friendly. Um, they have point of use facilitation notes. It, it's scripted out. So I never like hearing a, a teacher say, I'm not a math person. Um, but there's people who do need support in math um, and making sure it's taught correctly so later on um, students can have success and not have to relearn something. There, and it comes with all of those tools. The lessons are interactive as well. Um, there's activities to do. There's um, different group activities to make sense of the math. There's digital opportunities as well. Um, some of the strengths that the committee pointed out, it is aligned to state standards. Um, I, I will share one quick story. When the committee was working, we had four different materials and we were looking at one standard of how the publisher presented that standard. And that was a really separating factor for the committee because clear math um, got to the level of complexity needed to make sure our kids would be successful. And we saw a couple other uh, publishers that had a lot of bells and whistles that didn't do it. Um, we like the hands-on learning, that it's engaging. It's got um, parts where the teacher's going to be teaching directly, and then times when students are going to be working together to make sense of the material. And it has different re-engagement lessons um, as well. So some of the staff feedback, um, staff that are using it and piloting it in their classes are loving it. 
Uh, a few are using it right now still and love, love it. They're liking it even more. It's engaging. Um, it gives kids multiple opportunities to practice. They're seeing the students improve their learning of math. Um, they like how hands-on the lessons are, that there's assessments and daily ratings to see how kids are doing. The kids are really enjoying the lessons as well. Uh, it comes with slides for the teachers to present the math concepts. I'm going to share a few more and then I'll share some parent comments as well. Um, the layout and the sequence um, makes sense to how math is learned. Um, it's easy to pull up um, and re on the re-engagement days and make sure that we have things in our centers um, ready to use. Um, how language or how fractions is taught makes sense. Um, my experience with clear math has been exceptional. My students are learning and when they struggle, there um, are good opportunities to intervene with the right resources. Um, kids are enjoying math. Um, and there is acknowledgement from our teachers that it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging, but that we can get them there. And it's the right material to be using to help our kids get to the math that they need. Um, it meets our needs. Uh, in February, we hosted a parent preview night where we had all of the different grade levels out and parents could um, get on the get into the books, look through them, they could get online. Um, Mr. Elkins had a presentation for our parents. We had translation available for parents as well. Um, and it was really powerful to hear some of our teachers um, share how they've been using it in class and what they like about it. Uh, we had community members fill out reviews as well. We received 31. Um, 27 of them recommended without any reservations. Uh, they can't wait to um, hear how much their kids will like it. Great materials, that there's additional materials at the grade levels. Um, it looks engaging, lots of strategies um, from multiple perspectives. Some more um, reviews from parents who recommended without any reservations. Um, they love it. They love the problem solving, the opportunities that students have. The materials look great, hands on. Um, the teachers who've started using it and sharing seem to really like the curriculum. They've been passionate about it. Let's see. Um, I, I want to mention a few. We had four recommend with reservation. Um, and one of those is um, the, the Spanish resources. Our dual language program needs Spanish materials in K-1-2. And we also really need a few in 3, 4, 5 as well for our new students who are arriving um, and are speaking mostly Spanish. Um, Clear Math and Carnegie Learning are working on having it ready this summer for students. And they've committed, we've put in the contacts, we've got to have that. Um, so they're working with us. We feel confident that they're going to have it. We've also talked with our dual language principals and teachers, and they've looked at the materials, what we've looked at in Spanish in third grade and in middle school that are already fully developed are great. They are the right materials and it's worth waiting just a few more months for the Spanish. Um, there were a couple other reservations. The teacher edition was rather jumbled. Um, they hope that the, all of the materials will be able to use, be used. Um, we have a plan for manipulatives. So we're going to keep what we already have um, and just supplement what we need and don't already have. So sometimes we've said surplus everything and we're going to say, no, hold on to those manipulatives. Um, it's just a better um, decision for us to do. Um, and then another concern about Let's see, again, could it be the grade level, but some are, were heavier on verbal and less focused on numbers than they expected. It does seem pretty consistent with current methods. Um, teachers did well at addressing concerns and explaining implementation expectations. Um, we have had it available in some schools for public to review as well. Um, and then just to mention, uh, this will be just over $2 million. We can use ESSER funds for this, and that will be for five years. This will include textbooks, 
uh, digital subscriptions, consumer workbooks, any manipulatives that we don't currently have, initial training, and then also on-site coaching and support through that first year, which is really imp uh, important. Uh, Mr. Elkins is going to stay on as a teacher on special assignment for the next year to help support teachers like unpack all the materials, start using them and figuring those pieces out, which is really important in the adoption that we are supporting teachers with those new materials. Let's see. Questions. So let's say quick question. So it's $2 million for the first five years. So what's the ongoing cost after the five is up? So we are still negotiating. The ongoing would be the digital. Um, keeping the digital and we are putting in the contract. We want to watch the digital usage really closely this year. Um, so we make sure that we are only paying for what's being used. Other, go ahead, Micah. A clarifying question. So, so 100% of this is paid for by ESSER funds. 100%. Okay. And then the only cost would be, oh, oh. well, yeah, yeah. After, Vic, well, in the first five years. Vic, yes. could you, do you want to come up and address any of those that you can and I can fill in too? So the ESSER cost, there, there's rules about, uh, you know, you can't use ESSER to pay for licenses. You know, you can only use it for a year. You know, you can't use it for four or five years. Our state hasn't uh, approved that. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, I am the, the, the hard copy, the anything hard copy, because that's, you're going to buy that in the, and you're going to use it. We can charge ESSER to that. So that's at least half of the $2 million. And then there's some, I think some consumables. Mm -hmm. So we uh, charge that to the ESSER too. Uh, and then we'll just move some money around to make it, work and use the answer for some other things that maybe we're already paying for or, or plans to replace some curriculum. Um, and I think they're working on the digital subscriptions to make sure we're only buying what we need or get a base. Uh, a lot of times we buy a lot of digital and people just don't use it. So we don't want to get mm -hmm. stuck doing that. Okay. So there's still a little work to do on cost. Okay. So, so in a sense, Esser, you know, by, by, by moving the money, by, by having us pay for something else and then moving that mm -hmm. money to this. Yeah. In yeah. essence, Esther is paying for. We can make it work and uh, it's opportunity to, to get this curriculum. It'd be hard to do um, if we waited money wise. And then uh, there's also some other uh, <coughs> math we're going to renew that we're going to try to do some things with the, the Esther and what we're kind of uh, saving and moving around. And, and there's some, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but so, some um, specific parts of ESSER that are for learning recovery, which is, you know, as we look at our data and areas that maybe needed help pre-ESSER, but certainly, you know, took a hit with COVID, um, math was an area that we felt needed some attention. And so taking this opportunity to put the investment there, um, is I think really important for us. And we've also looked at, um, and this will be a future conversation, but you know what we've typically budgeted for curriculum adoptions annually, given that so many of our existing curriculums have a digital component that, that has to be renewed mm -hmm. <laughs> on some level of frequency more than you know buying a new print book. Um, it's just really, causing us to think differently and look differently at our long-term curriculum budget. Yeah, and most of the, the digital has been bought up front, and that's just where we need to uh, not buy so much up front that's not getting used, you know, what Dr. Pierce is doing too. Thank so, you. from what I'm, oh, does somebody have a question? I had one more, but yeah, please, go. please, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Um, so, I, I know you had the, the, the comments that were, I don't, not negative, but with concern, I guess the reservation is the term. Mm -hmm. Did you have, were, there, were there any negative, just all no. out, like no, just negative? No. There were no, I can't recommend this. Okay. And you're, you love this. I do. And the teachers <laughs> who are using it love it. I mean, I hear still every day, every time I talk to teachers. 
<laughs> yes, he is the microphone. I should. I mean, I, 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 he's really happy about it. <laughs> I, I do, and there are a bunch of teachers who are using it and more every day. Honestly, um, after we got done with the parent preview, um, I had lots of it left that I could get out to the building, so I've managed to get get out about. 40 sets so there are lots of teachers who are using it and i have yet to hear a negative comment from a teacher hmm. um, the closest thing to a negative i've heard was that um, it's a little more prep work for some of the chapters um, but it's the that was immediately followed up with but it's well worth it because the lessons are just so much better than anything that we've been using so um, that's okay. yeah. thank you yeah. thank you awesome. so, so since you're here how <laughs> and Elizabeth probably knows this too but how many classrooms you said we have 40 how about how many classrooms are there that are using this or piloting it so i don't have a, like an exact number I, there are about five teachers who have been using it for since like since since november okay. um and then there are other teachers who are just trying you know lessons here and there so you know they're there i'm getting them out so that people can use them but there are about there are about five teachers that are, that are you that have been using it since november um and i've actually been able to out to watch all of them I, I was in a kindergarten class where i was doing jumping jacks as part of the math lesson so that was fun um but i as i've watched them i mean the, you know those teachers are loving it the teachers who have been using it for that time I, mean, I was just curious to know if we had enough piloting it for long enough that we might have some data but it sounds like maybe not yet no okay. no the the two teachers who are you know who are really gung-ho about it um they would tell you that their kids are doing better than they've been doing but i don't have any like hard okay great real data great thank you so going back to the slide of the 2022 to 2023 <laughs> smart balance assessment uh -huh. um sorry <laughs> uh, go right there josh don't you yeah yeah so i guess this is this is that year are these numbers pretty consistent for the last let's say decade I mean, are we seeing this general decline toward eighth grade we can go to the ospi report card and it'll have a trend line um, I mean, like, so for third grade, is it typically 40 percent? Like, general trend, is this what we're seeing? I mean, these numbers are consistent. I mean, this is because this is a one year snapshot. If we looked at the last 10 years, would it be pretty consistent? Um, yes, I, and I can follow up. up. I'm pulling it up right now. You want me to put it up here? That's okay. So, okay. I guess what I'm part of where I'm going with this is, is so are we thinking the issue is the curriculum? Or, or a big problem is it's part of it a big part of the problem a part is the of it is that the instruction is the other part and then what are we doing when kids get it what are we doing with kids when they don't get it okay so it, it all goes together so in the kindergarten levels our, our kindergarten student in the in the let's say elementary school levels we feel like our biggest issues on why kids are performing poorly are one curriculum, two instruction, and three, uh, we might say uh, remediation, Fo follow it. How do we remediate it? when they don't when they don't get it? What do we do? And what are we doing when they get it? When they get both it, both okay. of them. Um, when is this? When if, if we pass this, when does it get implemented? Uh, wide. It will be implemented in the fall. We will have training in June and August, and we start implementing in the fall. And what will we be doing to track to, to know that this is working differently than where we are at right now? Mm -hmm. when, when will we start to see outcome changes? We will be looking at that star and map data that we so talked January. about. Um, we'll, yes, I would say January. And really, we will need all year uh, yeah. to see it. So we'll get preliminary data in January. <laughs> By the end of the first year, we should have first year data. Mm -hmm. If we see no change, what will we do? I, I know I'm just trying yeah. to let put a plan now because if we're going to do this, I, I want to know what our plan is for. If it doesn't, if we don't see a change, what is our what is our strategy? If we see a big change, what is our strategy? That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, so it it'll go to those professional learning communities and seeing like where is it working? What are they doing? How do we replicate it in other classrooms? Um, so we have the answers here in Kennewick and we need to make sure they're happening in all of the classrooms. So I would say it would if it's if we don't see changes because we change the curriculum, we go into the instruction. Okay. Even more than we are right now. 
So, so we're that confident that the curriculum is, if, if we change, the curriculum is not the problem. So can you? So, so if, if, if in a year the numbers haven't changed, you're saying that it must be instruction, right? So, so we're that confident this curriculum is that good. Yes. Okay. And can I just interject um, a, a couple things from my perspective? Yeah, so when we talk about curriculum assessment and instruction, they all go together, yeah. right? Because um, you can have a really excellent teacher who doesn't have appropriate materials, and it just makes it all that more challenging mm -hmm. for them. They have the pedagogy, but they don't have the materials or they don't have the assessments. So we want to provide, you know, the best <laughs> materials that we can, the best training and expectations for our teachers. So we're equipping them to be able to best do the job. Um, Sorry, so it's not, you can't just like yeah, do, so do one and not the other. Though. And the other thing is I just want to highlight, typically there can be what's called an implementation dip when you implement new materials as teachers are learning the new materials and figuring them out. Um, and sometimes that implementation dip, it, 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 the dip shows up in the data. So um, I don't think, I mean, we're going to monitor it very carefully, yeah. but I wouldn't want us to be like completely alarmed and say, oh, we made a bad mistake yeah. because that's got it. That's part of the expectation that you're going to see that a little bit in some of the data. Um, we were just pulling up and I, I only looked at third grade and I can look up yeah. any other um, years, but kind of there's a we, we have to we can look at 17, 18 and 18, 19 and then 2021. 20, take take <laughs> yeah. And so so we were at third grade we were at like 51.5% of third graders meeting the uh, third grade standard in math in 1718. We were at 54.1% in 1819. We're now at 43, right? Sure. Um, and we might want to look at an upper grade too because the third graders... Is this, yeah, is this you a know, trend that we dropped 10% after COVID? I mean, is this that these kids... Yeah, so let me look. Get, the third graders would have been in kindergarten, yeah. right? Right. So let me look just at, um, at, at fifth grade. So in fifth grade in 1718, pre-COVID, right, only 39% of fifth graders. Okay, uh, so five years, 5% five still better. And then um, 40 0.5% of fifth graders in 18-19. Then when you jump to 21-22, 32%. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 22-23, 34.8%. Well, so we'll have to look. I think we we'll have to look at that too, because when you're talking, when you're just looking straight fifth grade, you you know right, those kids are. Years. So we'd have we'd have to like. But what you're saying is, is there, cohort. To right, the right. We're looking at different groups yeah, of kids. But correct. but what you can see is is I mean. We were roughly around 50 percent in third grade, roughly around 40 percent in fifth grade, mm -hmm. and we dropped five, not 10, five percent on each with COVID. Over yeah. COVID, then everything dropped five percent, and and it would be interesting to see is if that's that's a universal. If we look and, and all everything fell five percent, because then we can call that learning loss, right? Mm -hmm. From COVID. Um, I but, think it's but, also the materials we we've, we've been. Using. So you think part, and when did we, that's what I was getting to my next question, when did we adopt the version of the curriculum we're using yeah. right now? Yeah. yeah. So um, this has been a, a work for me for the past four years that I'm really passionate about. Um, so Oregon was adopted, I believe, in 2012, or 2012, no, that seems too late. 2016, okay. Um, and so, you said 2016? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. And no, so, said six years ago. So yeah. When we adopted the curriculum, um, I think there was a lot of training that went along with it. But as time has progressed, one thing that we did in preparation for this adoption is to really look at the curriculum and what the publisher says the standard that they are covering is. And what we found was a publisher will cite this is teaching this standard. And when we really dug into it, we found it is not covered to the complexity and depth that we are currently expected to do. And so in that work and that learning, we figured out that the materials that we currently have with Oregon are not quality materials. In fact, um, when doing some research, I think us in Kennewick and Hawaii are some of the only in the United States using Oregon. 
and so it's a little concerning um, whenever we look at uh, it's not a material that's currently adopted or used widespread. Um, Carnegie came in and they've done some uh, instructional professional development for us, which has been really impressive. Uh, they have they value very much the deep learning and the supporting of teachers and the supporting of students learning more beyond just a fact and really to deeply understanding and applying the map in a real world, world situation. Um, so it's been something we've had a little experience with. Uh, when Alyssa uh, uh, mentioned that we looked at standards and it kind of set curriculums apart from each other during this time, it go goes back to how we looked at Oregon. And when we really dove, dove into the curriculum, we found that Carnegie covered the standard very in depth. And what we also had was teachers identified what is the most critical standard at your grade level that you say every student needs to have. It's just vital to their growth. And that's the standard we focused on at each grade level. And by far, Carnegie uh, covered the depth and complexity. Um, they provide questions for the teacher that's not the math teacher. Like, these are some things that you should ask to really stretch your, your student's thinking. So there's a lot of components beyond just a textbook. And I feel like that's what we've had before ago is a textbook. And really, without the growth of teachers in depth of understanding, I felt very um, excited at the opportunity. And and when we talk about our our students deserve better, and I really believe the city of the the instructional material we provide that. So a couple more questions. You mind asking? Matt, you brought up more questions for me. Sorry. What other what other districts in do we have other districts that we know they're using clear math and. Do we have we asked them what their outcomes are, uh, how how they've done in terms of their yeah Dave's standards. been working on it this week at Fed, Kent Federal Way. So there there are, are a lot of districts who are using the middle and high school, but this, honest this is a, it's a new curriculum at elementary. So um, there are this is a new curriculum. This is a new curriculum to elementary. But it's not a new publisher. It's not a new publisher. They've been doing math in, at the middle school and the high school for for, for a while. Um, and um, the, the the other districts who are using them for middle school and high school love them. They think they, they, they really like them. Um, they like the professional development they provide. Um, so, but it is a new, it is a new to the elementary, but it is also a right. lot better than anything that we looked at. And the at. districts are Sunnyside? Sunnyside, Kent. Spokane, and they're all uh, looking to adopt it as well. They're already using it in the middle and high school. Oh, in the middle and high school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the thing about the publisher is they solely focus on that. Yeah, they don't. Have, <coughs> they're not. They're not like a HMH or McGraw Hill where they've got a hundred different things that they're working with. They're doing math. You know, they're going to dip into that. I'm sure in the future, but right now it's just math. So. It's math is what they do. Do you have what? No, have they been around for very long? Mm -hmm. Just saying that they're going to dip into something in the future makes me think that they, they are a new publisher. They're not. I'm not no. familiar with it. Okay. No. So they've got a good track record. Yeah. Yes. Yep. It, it, within Edgar Parts, there are about near perfect, if not perfect, ratings, which is something that you don't see with all the publishers. Um, our current Orgo, if you ask, um, it is, uh, it was in the yellow, and that probably doesn't mean anything, but you want it to be in green, and they have some sections in red, which is something that you know. So I guess it begs the obvious question, and I know probably you don't have, but I assume that the people who made the decision for Orgo six years ago were enthusiastic about it, thought it was great, thought it was a good, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, what did we do, di like, how are we making sure we're not making the same mistake twice? Just a different name. So, I mean, I wasn't, I was a part of the adoption for the middle school, because that's where I was at the time. Yeah. But I do know that there were two curriculums that they, I mean, it wasn't like, one of them was way like it wasn't like like with Carnegie it's 93% of the staff says this is the one they want and that that wasn't the case with Oregon I mean it, more staff said they wanted it than not but um, 
I can say a huge difference is we brought in a teacher on a special assignment for this adoption. Um, Mr. Elkins has been living, breathing, sleeping about math for the last 18 months to make sure that we use these funds well and that we get the best materials. Um, we didn't do that with the last adoption. We had a lot of, um, I think at that time we were still doing K-12. Um, to, so we were looking at elementary materials, we were looking at secondary materials, we, we did three geometry books. Um, so we are changing how we're looking at materials based on that. And, and I'll also share, because I was a part of the middle school adoption, so the runner-up was at Visions, which is what we use at the middle school, and I think it's a fine curriculum. But this is, this is better, and this is going to do more to change instruction than Envisions will ever do. Um, because because of the way it's designed because of the the feedback that that they the students give the teachers because of the design of the lessons everything about it is just better than than envision i mean it, it, it just is i think this is important for you to know too this adoption we did a little bit different the previous adoption there were dots maybe put on what you liked best this one we moved away from the bells and whistles uh, somebody can come in and show you all these great tools and and we were very intentional the three of us in we want you to look at the map not the great bells and whistles that have moving avatars and those things we want you to look at the map yeah. and this was a clear um, improvement yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and I would say a clear um, favorite so, so maybe to sum it up, make sure I understood correctly, I always like to try to close the loop here. Is just, we, we, we were mistaken last time because one, we were maybe had too broad of a scope going from trying to find a program that covered everything, you know, K to 12. And then also we may have gotten distracted with extras rather than focusing on the core. Is that, am I hearing that correctly? And we had a very clear rubric this time. Okay focused on standards and, and we had someone focused only on this so yeah. in the previous one the person running it had other duties, other duties to do as well so did you i imagine you looked over a number of different <laughs> courses though and, and beyond just clear math uh, yeah we, we started out um, we actually started out with 10 sets of materials um and then we had a small group during the summer that met um and honest uh, you know from there we narrowed it down to the four materials honestly we should have narrowed it down to three because there are really only three that we're going to fit our needs um the one with the most bells and whistles is the one that got ruled out pretty quickly actually um, when they narrowed it down to two the one with the most bells and whistles was not because if the map just wasn't as good um, it was very basic you weren't going to you weren't going to see the the depth of the questions that were being asked weren't going to get you what you want on the sba they just they are I appreciate it. It looks like this has been a very thoughtful process. And you're, like I said, I, I appreciate you. It looks like we learned from mm -hmm. what didn't work last time. And I think that's great. I, I guess one more thing, and this is more of a question for Tracy and maybe Elizabeth. As we move forward, you're bringing up, I mean, there's more and more free content online. Yeah. Um, are we looking at ways to perhaps go away from purchasing curriculum and perhaps using Open. Mm -hmm. a, a mixture of content developed within our, I mean, for example, it sounds like we've got some great teachers back there who might look at the span of, of, of what is out there and develop a curriculum that won't cost mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. $2 million um, for the future. Is that something we're looking into, not just in Mm -hmm. you know, one, in all yes. of our curriculum. Mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. Couple things on that. There's a, um, with our middle school dual curriculum yeah. right now, we're actually taking that direction of having it be um, developed, yeah. like having the cur curriculum, we're developing the curriculum in-house because mm -hmm. there just really isn't anything that exists um, to meet that need. And so using that as a, a little, and it's a, it's a pretty limited um scale mm -hmm. of an adoption so um, learning from that process and seeing how we can apply it potentially to other areas I, I think we're always going to need this is just my bias tonight at no, this point in time I think we're always going to need elementary literacy 
a, a, a curriculum, a set of materials, a program, an elementary math. I can envision, and maybe this is because I taught secondary, um, having more of that sort of approach of using open educational resources and frankly in the future AI mm -hmm. um, and using that to build our own yeah. um, internal materials. I mean, I think we, we still want to have a guaranteed and viable curriculum. We want to make sure that the standards are being taught and assessed in a similar fashion and yeah. that we've got an adopted set of materials mm -hmm. and it's not just the wild, wild west where you know, everyone's just out finding stuff online and using it. I mean, that's not what we want. But for us to be able to do that centrally from the district for some of our um, grade levels and content areas, I think is going to be really appropriate. Um, not for all, but you know, it's it's not just a matter of there's great there's things out there. We have great people who know their content well, and we can use AI to our advantage. Uh, but the curriculums themselves, the publisher, they're just becoming astronomically expensive, expensive yeah. and really not sustainable to, to, to have this sort of a program for, you know, K-12 in every content area. It's just there's not enough money. Um, so long answer to your question, but yes, definitely. And part of our uh, work this year mm -hmm. is looking at our curriculum adoption cycle mm -hmm. um, because of these budget constraints um, and moving things from seven years to 10 years. We have digital mm -hmm. licenses that are going to be running out this year, next year, and we've got to make some plans on how are we going to renew them or are we going to do other open educational resources. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry, I had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have two statements. Um, one, when I was on a visit recently to Hayman Creek, I ran across, I believe there's a kindergarten teacher there that's using the material, just seemed to rave about it, how much they enjoy it, and the kids um, were able to follow along. And then, of course, full transparency, I heard about all the meetings because my wife was on the adoption committee. Um, and I heard an example recently where um, in one of our schools, the um, one teacher gave a lesson to the entire grade level. I think it was fractions and the whole grade level passed. So um, just some examples and, and feedback I've heard. So just wanted to share that with you guys. So, um, awesome. So if there's any more, if there's no more questions, no more discussion, um, I will take a motion for a recommendation on adopting the curriculum. I'll I'll motion to adopt the curriculum. Oh, I have to read it down. Yeah. Sorry, Bob. I gotta get there. Uh, I would like to make a motion for the school board to accept the math adoption and instructional materials committee's recommendation to adopt Carnegie Mellon or excuse me, Carnegie Learning Clear Math Elementary for kid grades K through five. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. So we have a first and a second. No more discussion. Patty, please call for the roll call vote. Mr. Connors? Yes. Dr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Gledhill? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. And Mr. Galbraith? Abstain. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Alyssa. Thanks. I mean, I wasn't going to be the deciding vote, but yeah. Um, all right. So with no new business left, we will move on to our next agenda item, which is discussing the next agenda. So for our next meeting, we have the 2024-2025 preliminary budget. We have our annual staff human resources update, a highly capable program update, and we are going to be discussing our second step digital materials as well. Do we have anything else for the agenda or to add to a later? So I, I'm... I might have something to add. I don't know. I'm okay. still very much learning my role as lead rep, but WASDA right now has an open, I can't remember the term, but there's an open session right now for school districts to propose any changes either to policy or to platform or priority for WASDA. That closes April 8th. So we don't have another school board meeting before then. And I've been 
doing my best to pay attention. There's not a lot of information about what school districts have discussed and submitted. So we'll we will get information about that later in the summer. We'll have a packet of information that we can review. Talk as a board about which changes we want to support, etc. The only one that has kind of come to my attention that I thought I would bring up if we have interest in discussing is there is um, Woodland School District. I was made aware they passed within their school district a resolution supporting making a proposal to WASDA to make local control and unfunded mandates um, a higher priority or a platform for WASDA. And given that we've had some interest of that, yeah. I didn't know if that was something that we want to discuss. We don't actually have to have a decision on what we want to do about that for we don't have to decide that before April 8th. It's just coming. It's coming up. So I don't know if that was something you wanted to have a discussion about. If it is, I will be better prepared and have better information for you about it. Yeah. So that would be, I believe that's, um, I know what you're talking about. I believe that's a bylaw change to, to a WASDA, to yes. a WASDA bylaw. So we have plenty of time to discuss that. So um, I'm, I'm open to having it as an agenda item to discuss. Um, the thing with bylaw changes, and Mike, maybe you might know this as well, but I believe you have to have multiple, like you have to have five or more schools, I think have to, pass, I'm not sure. I, I, there's a number of schools that have to pass the same resolution. resolution, I think, to get it like actually into WASDA to be voted on. So, um, but yeah, if you want to provide that and then we can discuss it at a future. Can the resolution then be sent? board packet yeah yeah well yeah yeah oh, the for our yeah. review yeah for our review yeah we want to do that is that what you're getting at? i mean what do we have to write our own is that no i think in the past what i from my understanding is it's it's based it it's got to be basically the same exact wording um is my understanding but you can double check that but let's okay, yeah i'll get we can put it on i'll talk to tracy and we'll see kind of what we have on the agendas and get it on something here in the future to discuss okay and then there was one other thing just to make you aware of um one of the wasda emails that came today the pdc has their regularly scheduled business meeting tomorrow and there is an item on their agenda where they will be having a discussion about um it didn't i tried to get as much information as i could from the from the agenda but some there's having some sort of a discussion about election parameters that might affect how school districts are allowed to speak about boards and or bonds and levies mm -hmm. when it's time for us to mm -hmm. run an election. Mm -hmm. I'm it's it, they're thinking that discussion is going to be at 10 15. I'm going to do my very best to listen in on that and gather some information. But if anybody else is interested or wants to listen in, you can I, just go to the PDC's website and listen to that. Yeah, um, Robin and I were talking about this today as well, and I saw it in the WASTA email that that came out and Robin's trying to tell me something. Good to know. Yeah, Thank probably you. The test case for that. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if anything comes of that, that we need to discuss, yeah. then we definitely want to bring that to an agenda as well. So um, I also, I yes. apologize. I forgot to bring this up during the soups report, but oh, this is the sign up for graduation. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've got one of these for everybody, and if you just want to write down, I know I you I got an email from you already, I'll Dr. Right, Miller, yeah. but so you don't have to do it if you don't want to. But just um, <laughs> you know which which ones you plan to attend, and then um, I don't know how you want to go about assigning speakers this year. If you want people who are interested, maybe yeah. indicate your interest of where you want to speak, and then if more than one person is interested in speaking. Yeah. You can decide who's sure. speaking. <laughs> Sounds good, yeah. Okay, so I'm if passing this down. If you're so. interested in speaking, just write it down and then we'll... And you said 45, 45 minutes. 45 minutes, yeah. <laughs> you were the last person you're before they get that diploma, yeah. so <laughs> if you go 45 you're minutes, you might get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Awesome. Anything else for the next agenda or agendas? Sounds good. Yeah. And uh, is, did you put my name already down there on that or no? Or do I need to? It's not I, I didn't yet, but I have oh, your email, so I can, I can oh. fill it in. Yeah, there's one for everybody. Oh, perfect. You good? I'm good. Are we good? Okay. 
all right so if there's no other business as authorized by law we will adjourn the meeting